Hello? Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? Welcome aboard Frank's Magic Bus. For the next two hours, Frank Welch takes you on a musical journey. Now, without further ado, Frank Welch. Right now, we're going to stop down and have a little chat with the author of a fantastic, fascinating book on rock and on trivia and behind-the-scenes stuff in rock and pop. The Wrecking Crew, well, they were musicians that actually played on the records in place of the people you think played it, like the Monkees and the Birds, Paul Revere and the Raiders, the Beach Boys. They were actually top-secret musicians in L.A. Well, let's find out all about it right now. Uh, we're with uh, Kent Hartman. He has the, a great new book, The Wrecking Crew, The Inside Story of Rock and Roll's Best Kept Secrets. Now, Kent, for the listeners, and I'm still shocked to this day, even people that grew up with me uh, listening to a great pop and rock in the 60s and 70s, how many people don't realize a lot of their favorite groups and artists did not play on the hit records. Now, who was the L.A. Wrecking Crew, and why did they even exist? Well, the Wrecking Crew was a small group, maybe a couple dozen people, that played secretly, secretly played the hits uh, for dozens of famous artists. And the reason the Wrecking Crew was hired um, is that back in the 60s and early 70s, it was very much a producer's medium, uh, you know, popular music. And so whatever the producers wanted to do was the way it went. And they wanted to hire the Wrecking Crew because they were the best of the best. They could play guitar, bass, drums, keyboard, saxophone, whatever, better than anybody else. They could come in and knock out a hit song in one or two takes. And it was much more efficient. And the Wrecking Crew could add extra flourishes. So, you know, a lot of our favorite bands were okay on tour on the stage, but maybe not so hot in the studio. Right. Let's say Gary Puck and the Union Gab needed some uh, woodwind or something, right? Yeah. Now, there, there's an example of a band that, that never played on any of their songs. Gary Puckett, you know, Woman, Woman, Lady Willpower, all those hits that they had, that's all the Wrecking Crew playing all those instruments. That is amazing. Now, I figure if I'm touring for a couple of years, let's say I'm a drummer in a band, and we finally have a hit record after after I paid my dues and we uh, lived uh, on fast food on the road for a couple of years, to walk in and have somebody tell me, uh, sit this one out, we're going to have some other musicians play on your record. Did some of these guys, musicians in these famous groups, kind of take it personally they were being replaced on the record? Yes, sometimes. Uh, not always, but sometimes. Um, there is. You, you mentioned... An example of being a drummer, um, there is an example or a, a really dramatic story that I have in my book about the birds. Um, you know, we all know and love Mr. Tambourine Man, which was their first hit, and it went to number one. But um, other than Roger McGuinn from the birds, who did play his 12 string guitar on it, there are no other birds playing anything on that song. And the drummer, Michael Clark, for the birds, didn't like that at all, and he had it out with the producer. Terry Melcher, and they had a huge heated four-letter word exchange in the studio over this very subject. You know, he says, hey, you know, this is a band, man, and I should be playing on our stuff. And Melcher said, well, you're not ready. You know, that's amazing because uh, they were actually a good band of uh, players, and the great Terry Melcher, of course, was a, a, a real good producer. He did what a lot of Paul Revere and the Raiders stuff, I do believe, too. Yes, he did. And, of course, on Paul Revere and the Raiders, when you hear, like, him or me, what's it going to be from 67? No Raiders on it. That's all the Wrecking Crew. And so many people still to this day uh, don't realize that, even though they grew up with that music. Now, uh, back to the Birds really quickly. Uh, David Crosby, who was a member of the Birds at the time, one of the biggest egos in rock, uh, how did he handle that? He didn't like it either. Now, he didn't have it out with Terry Melcher. What Crosby did was, uh, and I was told this by Roger McGuinn. I interviewed Roger at length for this book. And anyway, he told me that... Um, David Crosby um, went back to the record label and especially to their manager and the Birds manager and, and complained loud and long. And so what happened was uh, by the time of the Birds' next single, which was Turn, 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 um, here's the difference. The Birds were allowed to play on it, but they weren't too good on their instruments, whereas it took the Wrecking Crew just a couple, three takes to bang out uh, Mr. Tambourine Man, it took the birds playing their own instruments something like 72 takes. Wow. But, you know, you listen to some of these uh, perfect-sounding number one songs, and I'm thinking about Bridge Over Troubled Waters, too, by Simon and Garfunkel. That's a, a, a song that they played on, right? 
Yes. Oh, yes. And our guest on Frank's Magic Bus is author Kent Hartman. It was a cool book out, The Wrecking Crew, available at Amazon.com and other sources. When I hear the pristine production sound, if I look back years later, even if I'm Crosby or somebody in one of those groups, and I realize that this sounds so much better than what we would have done, I'm almost thankful. Has anybody had that attitude? Well, yes, today, if you talk to most of them, they're not nearly so hot under the collar because what the Wrecking Crew did in conjunction with these producers, you know, the Phil Spectors and Brian Wilsons and Terry Melchers of the world, like you're saying, they handed these bands hits. And so now these band members are grateful because how long have they been out on tour? I mean, various members of all these bands are still playing. That is true. Uh, why don't you floor our listeners by just, uh, we'd be here three hours if we ran down a laundry list of all the big hits and the big groups, but just name some of the bullet points, famous hits or famous groups that really were not those groups playing on the records, but the L.A. Wrecking Crew. Well, just going back to the earliest days, um, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, when you hear those hits, uh-uh, it's the Wrecking Crew. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Beach Boys, starting in about 63, late 62, um, all the hits that we know and love from the Beach Boys, including the, their famous Pet Sounds album, you know, that's all the Wrecking Crew playing, all those instruments. Jan and Dean, the Righteous Brothers, Gary Lewis and the Playboys, the Mamas and the Papas, the Association, Simon and Garfunkel, the Birds, uh, the Fifth Dimension, Paul Revere and the Raiders. Even, you know, I even hate to say this, you know, I, I know that you're playing classic rock, but even the Partridge family was the Wrecking Crew. That's right. You know, the thing is, at that time, uh, you know, I was in high school at that time. A lot of this stuff was coming out in grade school, growing up with these things. And uh, people in general are more sophisticated now with the Internet and everything, and they can find out these things. Back in those days, we had no clue. When I would listen to the Monkees in junior high, I had I believe that those guys were playing on those records. But wasn't that the Wrecking Crew? Oh, yeah. The Monkees were all the Wrecking Crew. And, of course, that's what the record label wanted you to believe. They didn't want to burst your little 12-year-old bubble there. and <laughs> <laughs> There were some extremely famous members uh, of the Wrecking Crew, uh, musicians in that little tightly knit group there in L.A. that would play on these records that later became pretty famous themselves. Why don't you name a few of those? Yes, there were two breakout people. Uh, most of the people in the Wrecking Crew, and again, there were only just like a couple dozen that played on most all these big hits, and, and literally, literally hundreds of hits, um, but the two, and, they, and for the most part, they were all happy to be behind the scenes, making good money, and you know, keeping their mouths shut. <laughs> um, but two of them actually wanted to become stars on their own. They always dreamed of it. And those two people are Glenn Campbell and Leon Russell. And boy, do they ever become big. Leon in classic rock ended up playing with the Stones and the Beatles and doing his own great records. And Glenn Campbell, a legend, right? Yes. Wasn't that Glenn playing on a lot of the uh, Beach Boys hits like Fun, Fun, Fun? And... Oh, yeah. Brian Wilson always wanted Glenn in there because Glenn had, um, you know, we all know Glenn is this singer of these famous songs and he's a personable guy and he used to have a TV series and, you know, he was even in True Grit with John Wayne. Um, but Glenn also, maybe foremost, is a top-notch guitar player. And so Brian Wilson used him on all the Beach Boys hits when you hear that uh, intro on Dance, 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 that really fast-paced intro, that's Glenn playing that. And the interesting thing about Glenn was, of all the people in the Wrecking Crew, he was the only one that couldn't read music. No kidding, Glenn Campbell could not? No, nope. he, but he had such a fantastic ear that all the producers, what they would do is they would come up to him and they would hum the part they wanted him to play, and then he would play it right back for them. I guess we shouldn't be too shocked because I don't think Lennon or McCartney back in the day read music, right, with the Beatles? No, they couldn't. And they and, and Paul McCartney didn't want to learn how to read music because he thought it might it might constrict his creativity. Wow. I'm kind of glad that he didn't. <laughs> on, on the legendary uh, Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds, and keep in mind that uh, whenever Rolling Stone or some other uh, publication puts out their occasional greatest albums of all time list, Pet Sounds is in the top 10 or 15 of all time albums. And I've got the box set to Pet Sounds, and that's all the bonus material and the studio chatter. So when I hear Brian Wilson giving directions like turn that bass down or bring this up, is he talking to the Wrecking Crew? Yes, yes, he is. I'm glad you brought that up. That's 
that's one of the best ways for the public to listen to what the wrecking crew had to say in the studio because Brian Wilson is, in fact, directing all of them. Yeah, there's not a Beach Boy on there, except for the singing, of course. Right, right. But... Brian, with his genius as one of the uh, preeminent uh, arrangers and producers of the 60s, along with, I think, John Phillips of the Amamas and the Papas, it was still Brian running things, though, right? Oh, yes. Brian was, uh, you know, he, he played for the Beach Boys in the very earliest days, but he realized his real strong suit was being the producer. He was the mastermind. And, of course, to this very day, Paul McCartney still holds Pet Sounds to be his favorite album of all time. In fact, he gave a copy to all of his kids and just insisted that they play it. Yeah, and and uh, Sgt. Pepper, I guess, was influenced quite a bit, he said, later by a Pet Sounds, and then uh, Good Vibrations, isn't that the Wrecking Crew? Oh, yeah, every bit of it. it. That was the single that came out just after Pet Sounds came out. Wow. Now, in your book, you mentioned that Hal Blaine, the drummer of the Wrecking Crew, played on seven consecutive Grammy Records of the Year. When you think of that now, now people recently saw uh, the Grammys, and they might watch it every year, and there'll be a Record of the Year. That's one of the big awards. But to be the drummer on seven consecutive of those today kind of seems unfathomable. Can you name at least a couple of those in that streak that he had? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of them, uh, the earliest one, I believe, was uh, A Taste of Honey by Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. And then, of course, I think the next one after that was Strangers in the Night for Frank Sinatra. The Wrecking Crew were all over that song, too. Oh, that's right. And then it had to proceed right on through Bridge Over Troubled Waters, right? It did. It did. That was sort of the, the shining moment, maybe, for the Wrecking Crew, because that song went to number one for six or seven weeks in 1970. And, you know, it's still a legend. Did they play on that whole uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters album, like Cecilia and stuff like that? Everything, whole thing. Same with the Bookends album before that with Mrs. Robinson and, and all those, in America, all those songs. And our guest on Frank's Magic Bus is Kent Hartman, author of the Wrecking Crew book on the L.A. Session guys in the 60s and 70s who supposedly played secretly on all these famous records. And I think a lot of our listeners right now are just kind of shaking their head in disbelief, as I said, even if they grew up listening to this music. But I used to know, even before I started looking into the Wrecking Crew, a legend, that uh, one of my favorite artists was Gordon Lightfoot on that number one album in 74. That Jim Gordon was the uh, drummer on both Sundown in 74 and Midnight at the Oasis by Maria Maldar, uh, both number one tunes. Uh, wasn't, yeah. And he was the Derek and the Dominoes, a drummer on Layla. Wasn't he a member of that Wrecking Crew? He was. He was sort of a protege of Hal Blaine's. Um, uh, Jim Gordon uh, was as good as it gets as a drummer. He was just a, he it just had a built-in meter. He was just a, a, a born groove machine. Um, you know, he played he played on Glenn Campbell's hit Wichita Lineman in the late '60s, and then by around 1970 or so, uh, Joe Cocker and those people, Leon Russell, who had broken away from the Wrecking Crew, they all wanted to hire Jim Gordon. So Jim kind of quit doing. Wrecking Crew stuff for a while, quote unquote, and he was asked then by Eric Clapton to join Derek and the Dominoes, which he did. He became their drummer, and he co-wrote Layla with Eric. Right, and I have uh, kind of made up my own trivia question regarding that. I, I would ask people who drummed on both Sundown and Layla. Two, you couldn't find two more different songs. One, you know, an album rock anthem. You know, Layla. The other one. Uh, kind of a folk rock thing from uh, from Gordon Lightfoot. But, uh, yeah, Jim Gordon was really sought after that uh, period of the 70s, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, everybody wanted him. Everybody wanted him. Um, Steely Dan loved him. You hear Ricky Don't Lose That Number? That's Jim Gordon playing drums. Oh, I did not know that. You hear You're So Vain, Carly Simon? That's Jim Gordon playing drums. Jackson Brown, uh, most of his stuff in the mid to late 70s was Jim Gordon. Wow. Uh, when you hear Dr. My Eyes, that's Jim Gordon. That is unbelievable. Of course, Jackson be, uh, starting out there in the L.A. area. Kind of uh, pretty unfortunate, pretty sad about to what happened to Jim Gordon. He, he en- ended up going crazy and killed his mother, I guess, uh, while he was flipped out, right? Yeah, I've got a really dramatic behind-the-scenes story about that in the book, and it's a sad story, but it's true. And that may be part of why he was so gifted, because he also heard voices his whole life. And, you know, it just kind of came to a head uh, by, like, 1982, and, and the voices sadly told him to kill his mother, and he did. And now he's in, he's in prison, and he's been there ever since. 
But he heard voices all his life? Yeah, and he might manage to kind of keep them at bay for a while. And, of course, as people did back then, especially in Derek and the Dominoes, there were some substances used to help keep those voices away. And But after a while, it just didn't work anymore, and he just went downhill. And he's he's really a sad case, but, you know... Arguably, you know, if not the most talented, he's in the top three of all the Wrecking Crew 